Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to the 10th annual undergraduate economics debate presented by the Department of Economics and the Undergraduate Economics Club. I'm Zach Bears, a junior political science and economics major, and I will be your moderator today. I hope you find the debate engaging and the evidence convincing and informative. This afternoon, these students um, will be debating the motion, Intellectual Property is Necessary to Promote the Progress of Science and the Useful Arts. In support of the motion is the team of Mel Abdul Mutalib, class of 2017, uh, Aaron Cooper, class of 2015, Victor Padachak, class of 2014, and Stephanie Staudenmeyer, class of 2015. Against the motion is the team of Martin Gall, class of 2016, Jonathan Lab, class of 2015, Keith Malott, class of 2015, and Andrew Randall, class of 2016. I'd also, <laughs> I'd also like to introduce our judges. We have returning Bill Troy, class of 1976. <laughs> uh, Lisa DeForge, class of 1987. Uh, James Santucci, class of 2013. And James Keller, class of 1985. The rules of the debate are as follows. First, the team in support of the motion, arguing in favor of intellectual property protection, will have 15 minutes to present their argument, followed by the team in opposition. This time is divided equally among the three members of the team. We will have a five minute period of deliberation for each team, followed by rebuttals. During the rebuttals, the team in opposition will send up members first, three members for three minutes each, followed by the team in support. Then the judges will be able to ask questions. Um, for each question, the teams will have two to three minutes to deliberate, and then a member of the team in support will give a two-minute answer, followed by the team in opposition, reversing the order for each question. <laughs> um, the judges will then have five minutes to deliberate, followed by the announcement of the winner and closing remarks. Without further ado, we can begin with the team in support. Hi, uh, good afternoon to the judges and fellow audience. Uh, for today's debate, under the motion of intellectual property, should be pro the protection of intellectual property is necessary to promote the progress of science and useful arts, we in the affirmative argue in the advocacy of the motion under three premises, which is number one, reasoning under Polanyi's perspective, number two, economic impact of intellectual property, and number three, the practicality of intellectual property. Before we move on to my first point, which is reasoning under intellectual property, I would like to define the motion word by word. And the two terms that I feel needs to be stressed on in this debate is intellectual property and science and the useful arts. We define intellectual property as a work or invention that is the result of creativity, such as manuscript or design to which one has rights and may apply for a patent, a trademark, copyright, or trade secrets. Essentially, it is the ownership of ideas and control over tangible or visual representation of the aforementioned ideas. And science and useful arts, we believe is a 19th century term, and we acknowledge its constitutional origins. For this, we follow the Supreme Court's definition of science and useful arts, of which under Golan versus Holder, they have defined it as a form of knowledge or learning and manufactured craft. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, as whole, we define this motion as a legal or any form with form measure with intention of preserving any creative work of which one has applied for copyright, trademark, trade secrets, or patents to help support and encourage a, con a continued qualitative improvement of knowledge and manufacturing craft. Now, beloved audience, I believe we should move on to my point, which is reasoning under Karl Polanyi's perspective. 
as the basis for my argument, I believe change under Karl Polanyi's perspective is initiated under the state to produce a competitive capitalist economy. This implies economically fictitious commodities such as land, labor, and money will subordinate the subsistence and substance of the economy into the market. This therefore establishes a market society which occurs when society decides to maximize their own utility as well as when price is adjusted according to the market. Polanyi believes that this creates unsustainability as the market, as the market society causes dislocations in the market. Under the double movement, where the economy tries to separate from society, we see social protectionism to be necessary in the state society. Therefore, historically, since we know that this industrial revolution has shown downsides where the poor have been transgressed in terms of their health, their, their financial stature, and their abilities, we know historically that social protectionism is necessary as the capitalist economy and the free economy will cause others without protectionism to be marginalized. Now similarly, since intellectual property is seen as a fictitious commodity and is highly regarded as a fictitious commodity, which can be defined as any non-labor produced goods that are bought and sold similar to any other commodities, we believe intellectual property is necessary. In this theory of embeddedness, which the, which we could see that the, the economy is not separate from political institutions and any other institution, we know intellectual property must be protected to avoid repercussions of the industrial revolution for two factors, morality and utility. And under this, we could see the John Lockean assertion that morality is important to help us in providing and promoting the, the science and useful, in promoting science and useful arts, which will, at the end of the day, help us in our progress. On top of that, protection is necessary for the basis of utility, as people will be more satisfied with the production of goods. We understand that intellectual property as the patent of office, as the US patent and trademark office has shown us, allows for greater production. And without intellectual property, we understand that we'll, there will be underproduction of goods. For this, we believe that monetarily, and, and so socially, intellectual property is important to be protected. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So, Following up on what my predecessor had spoken of, of um, I will be talking about how the intellectual property rights are necessary for the growth and sustainability of mankind. Over the past two centuries, according to Wolf, world population has grown sixfold since before then. During this time, world GDP has also grown almost 50-fold, and GDP per head has grown almost 10 times. In these two centuries alone, we have had growth that has been exponential, and it's been faster than any other growth that we have ever seen in humankind. In numbers, as you can see here, in 1800 years, world GDP only increased several hundred billion dollars from year 1 BCE to 1800. However, in the past two centuries, world GDP has increased from 175 billion to well over 70 trillion in today's dollars. So the question that we're left with here is, how is this growth to be accounted for? How is it possible that in two centuries, we are able to produce so much capital and have so, much, so many gains? And the answer is one simple world, capitalism. The introduction of Enlightenment era thinking during the 1700s served as the moral basis under which capitalism was able to be constructed as an economic system. This basis also prompted the introduction and the growth of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution helped to bring world production to an alarming speed hitherto unseen anywhere. And 
through this, it helped to raise the standard of living by providing new jobs and new forms of income for people throughout the entirety of the world. In these past two centuries, humankind has made more scientific, technological, and intellectual breakthroughs than ever before. Capitalism and the underlying idea of intellectual property rights on which capitalism is based serve as the primary causes for all of the growth that we have experienced. Capitalism is a system that rewards people via profit. You are able to market the ideas that you come up with and you have the potential to turn them into money. People are incentivized to produce because of this profit motive. People work for their own benefit. This incentive that is given to people under this capitalist system is only protected because of intellectual property rights. People are inherently rationally selfish and they will seek to do work that is of greatest utility to them. Whatever maximizes their own utility and their own happiness is the work that they will engage in. And if they cannot work for their own benefit, they will not work. Under intellectual property rights, people are able to come up with ideas and use them and claim them as their own and then make the and attain the highest utility possible from these ideas. It is the protection of these rights that guarantees that the ideas that a person is able to come up with is theirs and that they can use it to make a profit. Without intellectual property rights, there is no profit motive to be had, and without profit motive, that means that the entirety of the capitalistic system is doomed to failure, and the lack of a capitalistic system essentially calls for a vastly deaccelerated process and motion of human advancement. So, in summary, intellectual property rights have brought wealth and prosperity to all of mankind at different rates, but nonetheless, the, the prosperity is undeniable. And the rate at which we have increased prosperity levels over these past two centuries have been far greater than any other rate that we have ever seen in the entirety of human history. Without intellectual property rights, none of this could have been possible. And if intellectual property rights were to be taken away, the growth of human progress would be lost entirely. Thank you. Hi, and welcome again. My name is Stephanie. Um, now that my partners have clearly demonstrated and um, performed the uh, or, now that my partners have clearly demonstrated the usefulness and uh, importance of IP for growth in our American economy, I would like to get right into the statistics and IP's placement in this U.S. economy. So recently, a study was published by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Administ uh, Office and the Economic and Statistics Administration that resulted in some really interesting facts about U.S. relationship with IP. Um, what they discovered was that in 2010, 40 million jobs were reliant on IP protection. These IP-intensive industries made up 25% of the U.S. workforce. These people, um, oh, I'm sorry, these uh, jobs actually accounted for 35% of that year's total global GDP, or, I mean total GDP, gross domestic product. Now, what is the difference between a non-IP intensive worker and an IP intensive worker? IP intensive workers make on average $300 more a week than the, the non-IP intensive worker. Now, this statistic comes because these people are blossoming in innovation. The, um, as Obama himself put it, IP is representative of the leading edge of the U.S. economy and the ingenuity of the American people. 
It is creating something instead of just copycatting. Um, I'd like to talk about one of the most important IP intensive industries, um, US e-commerce. E-commerce touched over $230 billion this past year with a 13% growth rate. Now, the internet is a business war hog. Without, um, nowadays and stuff, the consumer is not restrained to the store. We can Google and compare. Location doesn't matter anymore. This is an incredible force for competition. But even Google would not be, um, even Google would not exist without IP protection. Because internet-based businesses, if you try to create a website and make an internet-based business, what is protected under IP? Well, your web content, your name, your logo, everything. So without IP, what would happen to this uh, giant economy? Well, we would have a million people ripping each other's content constantly. And this would result in a lack of organic filter for um, Google search engines or anything like that. So what you have then is that a million people are copying each other's websites. And then this will result in a uh, horrible difference between the, the barriers to competition with the rich and the poor. Because if you think about it then, without an organic filter trying to create an internet business, competitively, you would only have the amount of money you put into sponsors. This is incredibly detrimental for the poor in this economy. Now, many argue for, um, may, many argue against IP because um, they say that without IP, it would be a free market. But I'd like to, uh, reiterate this fact. Logically, this doesn't make sense. And for example, uh, many of the people use as an example against IP, the fashion industry. This is an ever-changing industry. But if you think about it, how hard is it to become a stylist because this is ever-changing? Leading name brands are taking these stylist ideas and running with it. So we have these crazy things like uh, game shows like Project Runway and all this other stuff to become a stylist. It's, an, it's a barrier to competition that, is, that it, you can't get over if you are not a named brand. So what would happen to each of these economies that are based off IP, this 35% of global domestic product. Without IP, what would happen to it? Well, I would say that there are many mistakes with IP, many examples of misuse and all of that, but the majority is protected under it. And it protects the majority of the businesses, and I, I, I'm not really sure if there's a better option. <laughs> I'm not as tall. There you go. All right. Hi, I'm Keith, and uh, today our team is going to be arguing the side of the opposition. When the Founding Fathers crafted our country's constitution, one of their goals was to set the foundation for an economy that would be both innovative and dominant. One of the ways they set out to achieve this goal was Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. It gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by granting authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective works for a limited period of time. The intentions of the men who signed the Constitution and therefore approved this clause were honorable. They wanted to ensure that inventors would have a period of time to monetize their original ideas. The thinking was that if inventors were not granted this right, other people could simply take their ideas and reap the benefits of their use without incurring the cost of their creation. This would reduce the incentive to invent, and therefore less people would do so. 
As a result, the rate of innovation would lower, productivity would be dampened, and the country's full potential for economic growth would not be realized. This was the thinking of the crafters of our Constitution, and it was the basic outline, argument outlined by the opposition today. Today we must look at the patent paradox. Is this system that is great at rewarding individuals simultaneously helping add to the entirety of our human intelligence? Is the notion that granting somebody exclusive rights to knowledge warranted by its supposed benefits? We argue that it is not. I would first like to demonstrate that intellectual property rights are not only unnecessary to promote progress, but that sometimes by willfully declining the legal protections patents guarantee you, innovation can actually be driven. Sometimes patent holders voluntarily share their ideas as a form of market research, an interesting trend that is being employed by large American shoe manufacturers. Designs for shoe models are being deliberately released into the black market. If Reeboks and Adidas are being pirated and Nike's new model is not, they know that it requires further development before they release it into the legal marketplace. Now this benefits both the company and consumers and drives innovation in the footwear industry. And it may seem trivial to discover consumer preferences towards sneakers, but it is not outlandish to imagine the same strategy being used in industries with more of a scientific focus. If this is the case, intellectual property rights are not only unnecessary to promote scientific innovation, but their absence can actually encourage it. The American patent system as we know it today has repeatedly created economic inequalities and inefficiencies. Intellectual property rights incentivize rent-seeking, which is the process of manipulating political situations and regulatory institutions to increase one share of already existing wealth without actually creating any new wealth. This is inefficient because it entails devoting resources to an outcome that does not increase the overall size of our country's economy. One example of this is patent trolling, which is the process of purchasing patents at low cost and either selling them for high prices or using them to launch legal claims against infringing firms. Institutions that participate in trolling do not develop technology or sell products, but instead they derive most of their revenue from filing legal claims. The reality is that patent trolling happens all the time. Over the past few years, the number of patent trolling cases has increased in both absolute terms and as a percentage of total patent cases filed. Since 2012, litigation with patent trolls has accounted for over half of the total patent cases. When there is rampant patent trolling, it both undermines the purpose of intellectual property rights and creates economic inefficiency. Based on research conducted by professors at the Boston University School of Law, in 2011, American businesses incurred $29 billion in direct costs from patent tro trolling litigation. To put this into perspective, American businesses spend about $250 billion annually on research and development. This means that the cost of defending against patent trolls is equal to over 10% of annual investments in R&D. There's a huge opportunity cost here. The money that is being devoted to these frivolous lawsuits can instead be spent in ways that actually add value to a business, such as product creation and improvement, bettering customer experiences, and building new factories or more efficient machinery. In today's business world, patents have become coveted financial assets. Corporations participate in bidding wars on key patents that will drive revenue growth and increase profitability. Small companies do not have the resources to make attractive offers to patent trolls, so all of the most valuable patents end up under the control of companies such as IBM and Apple. This is creating monopoly situations as the biggest companies are the only ones who have the patents they need to make the best products. The reward is the right to block out competitors, lower output, and overcharge consumers. The downfalls of the current patent system were not unforeseen by the men who created the infrastructure for it. Thomas Jefferson warned that grants of this sort can be justified in very peculiar cases only, if at all, the danger being very great that the good resulting from the operation of the monopoly will be overbalanced by the evil effect of the precedent, and it being not impossible that the monopoly itself, in its original operation, may produce more evil than good. It seems as if the fears harbored by our founding fathers have become a reality. Forgive me if this gets a little loud.
Today, the United States is in the thick of an era of patent extremism. With this extremism comes an increasing trend toward longer lasting patents, protection of abstract ideas, and an increasing effort by corporate conglomerates to keep small innovators out of competition. As there is no substantial evidence that increasing intellectual property rights proves direct causation to increase innovation, we must come to the realization that intellectual property rights are not necessary. Rather, they have facilitated a system so robust and nebulous that patents have surpassed their threshold of effectiveness and have entered a downward slower trend toward a failed system. Barry Schwartz and Adam Grant of the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania elaborate on this idea, explaining that there is a point where positive phenomena reach inflection points that watch their effects turn negative. What Schwartz and Grant have discovered is that every beneficial input or resource or advantage, whether it be money, happiness, justice, or protection of intellectual property, eventually becomes problematic and ineffective. Schwartz and Grant simplify this idea to the elementary statement and title of their work, Too Much of a Good Thing. This is precisely what the protection of intellectual property rights has become, too much of a good thing. Throughout this debate, it is imperative that we understand that my partners and I are here today to articulate the fact that the status quo is not a be-all, end-all solution to promoting the sciences and useful arts. Rather, patents have become the bane of the United States economic advancement. Derek Khanna of Forbes elaborates, stating Madison ominously warned that all monopolies, including copyright, must be guarded with strictness, angst, abuse. Abuse is precisely what we have seen. The estimated total number of defendants sued by patent trolls more than tripled from 834 in 2007 to 3,401 in 2011. Furthermore, according to a study by the United States Government Accountability Office regarding infringement lawsuits, the overall number of defendants increased from 2007 to 2011 by an astonishing 129%. Look no further than Silicon Valley to see patent extremism at its, at its finest. According to William F. Miller of the Silicon Valley Edge, during the 1990s, the portion of the Valley's workforce in the research and design was 10%, a full two and a half times the national average. Logically, with the future of job creation resting in many of these startup companies, the United States ought to uphold a system to protect these companies. Ironically, the system that we've created has done the opposite. The intellectual property rights that we've put in place to promote innovation for small companies has shown little success. In fact, increased intellectual property laws have not spurred a surge in innovation or research and design. Rather, many large firms have decided to harvest patents as a defensive strategy. An empirical study of patenting in the U.S. semiconductor industry showed that many firms use patents more as a horizontal strategy rather <clears throat> rather than to gain market value from rival firms and assist them in obtaining favorable terms in cross-licensing negotiations. Lester C. Thurlow of Harvard Business Law Review explains why this is problematic for software-related companies, many of which reside in Silicon Valley. He writes, companies such as Intel have big legal budgets to defend what they think is their property, but they also are accused of aggressively attacking what others think is theirs in order to create uncertainties, time delays, and high startup costs for, for their competitors. The end goal of companies like Intel is to keep disruptive innovation out, and they do so by abusing intellectual property rights and using the law as an instrument of destruction for startup companies. The GEO explains that the cost of defending one patent infringement lawsuit, which excludes any damages awarded, was from $650,000 to $5 million in 2011. PMEs are more willing to bring lawsuits based on broad interpretation of their patent claims because they cannot be countersued for patent infringement since they do not produce a product. Essentially, intellectual property, rights, uh, intellectual property rights have become a win-win for large corporations who work with PMEs and a Berlin Wall for small companies. A company named Vlingo epitomizes this story. Mr. Phillips, the head of Vlingo, worked for three decades to program a speech recognition software similar to what we have seen with Siri's Apple, with Apple's Siri feature. Unfortunately, Mr. Phillips was bought a, brought to court and he won. Yet regardless, according to the New York Times, the suit had cost $3 million and the financial damage was done. Mr. Phil's small company was crushed as, by this, and as he explains, we were on the brink of changing the world and before, before we got stuck in this legal muck. If we look to the GEO's analysis of where the most patent infringement claims are filed, we see that most cases occur on the west coast of California, but more specifically, Silicon Valley. Mr. Phillips' story is not an anomaly. The same story is happening for all, all sorts of startups across the country. Disruptive innovation is the touchstone of economic advancement in regards to today's economy. Unfortunately, due to intellectual property rights, companies similar to Mr. Phillips are being crushed by patent protections from PMEs and the conglomerates that work with them. Our focus on intellectual property rights has become so rooted uh, so rooted in protecting everything under the sun that it has manifested itself into a broken system that keeps the powerful on top and the innovators out of the question. So much so that startup companies typically stay as far away from patents as possible. Michael J. Muir expands on this saying just 24% of patent startups, 24% uh, of venture-backed startups had any patents within five years of receiving financing. 
Judges, today we must look at the overarching goal of this resolution. Please make a vote today for future bilinguals and, the, more importantly, the future of America's economy. Thank you. intellectual property rights and whether the purpose is still relevant in modern society. Some may say we have touched upon the most conceivable outcomes of a world with such laws, but I offer that we have yet to truly ask ourselves the largest and most fundamental question that is the keystone to this entire discussion. The question is, what type of civilization do we want to become? Are we merely profiteers who are blinded by our own ambitions, or are we a group of beings who together can build a truly wonderful world? I argue that we strive to be the latter, but through action, we are the former. The pharmaceutical industry is a strong example of this particular reality. The pharmaceutical industry is understandably tied to the discussion about intellectual property rights. Patents have traditionally been a, a way to incentivize companies to find research and development. However, intellectual property protection in the pharmaceutical industry has repeatedly created negative outcomes for the people who are supposed to be beneficiaries of medical research. Pharmaceutical companies regularly report huge profit margins regardless of their claims that patents are absolutely necessary to ensure their survival. What intellectual property rights in the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry have brought about is a monopolistic market that effectively prevents financially strained individuals from receiving the care that they deserve. In April of 2013, the Supreme Court heard a case brought against the molecular diagnostic company Myriad Genetics. The Association of Molecular Pathology filed suit challenging the val validity of Myriad's patenting of two genes they had isolated. The genes sometimes contain mutations that predispose women who carry them to breast cancer. Information contained within these genes can be used to improve breast cancer detection and prevention techniques. Since Myriad had pat patented the genes, other companies could not test their patents, uh, could not test their patents or patients for them. Before the case was brought to the Supreme Court, intellectual property rights created a, a situation that prioritized corporate profits over the health of our country's citizens. Myriad ended up losing the case and numerous medical providers now offer the genetic test. Sometimes though, the negative outcomes brought about by intellectual property rights have a longer lasting effect. In 1980, the court case Diamond uh, vs. Chakrabarty ruled that genetically modified organisms could be patented. Shortly thereafter, a Harvard University biologist was granted a patent for a mouse that had been genetically modified to be susceptible to breast cancer. The mouse proved to be a useful way to examine the effects of breast cancer and test different treatment options. Any other private researcher who wants to use the genetically modified mouse of his or home for his or her own research must first pay large royalties to Harvard. These royalties are often in the millions of dollars. Even though these patents were issued in the late 80s, Harvard continues to garner payments from researchers who wish to improve the quality of breast care uh, cancer patients receive. This is undoubtedly stymieing the progress of medical research. Pharmaceutical companies downplay the negative externalities that are brought about by their intellectual property rights, while at the same time overstating the importance of patents as, as assets. Is it so far-fetched to imagine a world in which medical research is driven not by promises of executive compensation, but by working towards the goal of bettering the lives of our fellow human beings? Research funded by the National Institute of Health has led to huge advancements in the fight against cancer, heart disease, and other illnesses. NIH-funded research has led to nearly 100 Nobel Prizes. This type of scientific research was not incentivized by promise of executive rights over their findings. In fact, the incentive was just the opposite. The men and w women who have made these advances in the field of medicine hope that their ideas are not hope that their ideas are not proprietary. They hope that their ideas are copied as much as possible so that their, that their positive out effects can be far-reaching. 
Time and time again, the legal protection of intellectual property rights has created economic inequalities and inefficiencies, dampening economic innovation. Is it possible that the concepts on which the edifice of intellectual property rights was built need to be reconsidered? Based on the repeated failures of the current system, it is evident that the intellectual property rights are not, not necessary to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Thank you. Hi again. At this point, um, both teams will have five minutes to deliberate, and then the team in opposition will send up three members for three minutes each for rebuttals. And the team in opposition will have nine minutes to rebut. Thank you. Okay, um, the first thing I'd like to address is when you put up a chart of GDP growth in America over time, and there was an exponential growth at one point, and um, I think this was in the second speech, you said that this had to be attributed to something, and then you logically concluded that because it has to be attributed to something, it must be attributed to the creation of intellectual property rights. Um, I think to attribute all or even most of our country's economic growth in the past two or three hundred years to intellectual property rights is a slam against the creative industrious people who make our economy move. We have incentives other than monetary gain when we create and innovate. We have open source software, which is an example of such things. People do not make money off open source software. Rather, they see a, a current technology that they think they can improve. So they do so, and then they release it for the public to consume without demanding any compensation. Um, also, I think to attribute the growth to um, IP rights ignores historical components. Globalization is a big reason for the GDP growth. We've had new markets that we've never been before able to tap into, so now we have consumers all over the world who have the opportunity to use American goods and services. Also, the internet is a big reason for the GDP growth, which is tied into globalization. And the internet itself was actually not created out of financial incentive. It was created by the government originally as a military strategy. Um, and in another speech, I'd like to address one more thing. You said that a beginner's game is no easy game without intellectual property rights. And this tied into when they were talking about e-commerce companies having a hard time if intellectual property rights did not exist. But in fact, they suffer with intellectual property rights. Time and time again, patent trolls target these small software companies who are producing software that falls under the scope of some abstract idea they've patented. So the way that the patent trolls approach the situation is they understand that small businesses don't have a lot of capital or equity. So what they do is they force small businesses to agree to a settlement that is less than the amount of money it would take them to fight it in court, even if they will win. So a small business could be approached by a patent troll, and they know that if they went to court and spent $2 million on legal fees, they would win, but their business would collapse. Instead, it makes more sense to give the patent troll $200,000, take the blow, and continue to fight for survival. So to suggest that without intellectual property rights, small companies and e-commerce companies would suffer, I think ignores the reality of what's actually going on. Thank you. general roadmap. I'm just going to flow through all of their overarching arguments, which was the Carl Polanyi argument about how it better society and also exponential growth is related to patents and also how there's a blossoming of innovation due to patents. So let's begin first with the Carl Polanyi argument. And they basically said that because of patents, they're calling for a better society and that, that a better society comes from these patents because it protects people and they aren't victimized, like innovators aren't victimized. However, let's look on the opposite side of that and see how people are actually victimized by it. On the one hand, you have these smaller companies that can either go to court for patent infringement and lose all of their company or just be bought out by these bigger companies. On the flip side, look at medicine and say I was there was a case where one man patented a gene that um, actually did tested for too many false positives with um, birth defects 
but another company used it and with two other studies, they found that they could track Down syndrome. However, then he brought them to court and because of this, he's suing them for every $9 fee for every $9 fee that this test was run in every single hospital. So if that actually, if he does win in court, the cost will more than double to figure out if someone has Down syndrome. So flip that argument. Now moving on to exponential growth, let's look to Tim Wu of uh, Columbia Law, and he says that we've had three decades of astonishing software innovations like the Lotus 123 spreadsheet, Netscape's browser, or Google search. And the patent is responsible for absolutely none of it. So what they're trying to relate is all this exponential growth to patents, but really you can take patents completely out of the question because these big so, like some of these software companies, even the big ones, have acknowledged that they didn't need patents to actually spawn any of this innovation. Like it would have happened regardless. Basically, the patents have for software companies, which is the biggest growing industry right now, it has been a failed experiment in innovation policy and an expensive one. Now let's move on to the fact that they say that there's more blossoming in innovation. Well, if this was true, let's look to the fact that uh, Michael J. Muir, as I brought up in my speech before, states that just 24% of venture-backed software startups had any patents at all within five years of receiving financing. So just as we brought up with the sneakers point, many companies are foregoing to even getting patents in the first place because the cost of getting them is it doesn't outweigh the benefits of having them in the first place. Now let's move on to their final point that says that everything would be copied. Well, my argument to this is yes, well, this really the, the only strong like argument that they have for this is that the only companies that really benefit by copyright are ones like Disney because if you look at the Sonny Bono Mickey Mouse Act of 1998, all this act did was focused on large companies who hold royalties after the author, musician, or artist is gone, and copyright keeps literary and music works unavailable because large corporations like Disney want to keep a few titles protected. To do so, the protection has to be extended to all works, essentially holding protected work hostage because licensing fees are too expensive. Basically, what we've shown today, judges, is that yes, I, intellectual property rights might have been something that we need in the past, but if we look to the status quo and the future of America and where our economy is going, they are obviously a detrimental factor to our economy. They're so detrimental to these smaller startup companies it's basically stifling innovation flip everything that our flip everything our opponents have said and flip it onto our side because we have shown throughout this entire debate why <laughs> not having intellectual property rights will bring more innovation and are not necessary thank you Um, Martin, I haven't had a, a chance to talk yet, uh, and I'm not going to evoke the uh, Polanyi Kuhn debates. Uh, well, let me start off. Uh, the internet is a very interesting thing, uh, just as Andrew talked, and uh, not just the internet, but you, uh, sorry, Stephanie, um, you made it seem as uh, the economy is dependent on copyright. It's dependent on intellectual property. It, it's 40 million jobs, 25% unemployment, sorry, 25% of all employment, 35% of the gross domestic product. But how do we know any of that is actually dependent on intellectual property? It's uh, based in industries that use intellectual property, but that is not the same thing. Um, you, I'm going to quote you. Internet without IP is internet without economic functionality. Amazon will disagree because it's, I mean, it's a retail store and they don't depend. They give you physical goods. It's not intellectual property and they're making a lot. Well, actually, they're not making that much money right now, but <laughs> <laughs> no one really knows. Well, maybe someone does. Um, you said there's a lack of a better option. Um, their innovation can come from a variety of sources and from most of human history, it happened uh, without any need for patents and uh, I think we kind of already addressed that. There are ways to create competitive spirit and resolve in potential innovators without bestowing the right to hold a monopoly. Sometimes all it takes to promote innovation is recognition. Government, nonprofit, and academic organizations such as the National Institute of Health, the Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or the Nobel Prize give one time uh, cash uh, prizes to innovators. Uh, creating something rather than copycatting, that's another quote that you gave. And I think that human, human beings 
uh, always will have art, will always have science of some sort because human beings want to explain how the world around them is. And getting rid of IP might mean the end of for-profit, big-budget Hollywood films, but that does not mean it's the end of film, it's the end of uh, any kind of research or anything like that. And, um, uh, and what about the people who uh, actually physically create the goods rather than just the ideas? I think I'm done. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Aaron. I also have not spoken yet. Uh, I have a few small things to get out of the way before going into the myriad uh, examples that they had brought up. Um, the idea that larger companies are using intellectual property as a club against smaller companies to try and protect the things that they have done. This is an idea saying that businesses are doing what businesses do because that's what business does. The idea that businesses are trying to protect the things that they have done is the thing that any person would do and certainly the thing that any business should and does do. In addition, you had mentioned last year there was 3,900 uh, intellectual property cases that had brought to court. That doesn't exactly sound like something that is extremism at this point if you look at the thousands upon thousands and upon thousands of cases that actually go through the American judicial system. Going to the myriad system where the company had patented the ideas of BRCA1 and BRCA2, which is the genes that they were looking for in women to detect breast cancer. What they had patented was not an idea. They had patented something that was part of the human genome. That's not an idea. That is something that, depending on like personal preferences, was come up by either a creator from religion or science. That was not a personal creation. And the fact that these medical companies and these pharmaceutical companies do what they are doing, again, that is a question against the judicial system, not against the idea of IP and the protection that it offers. It has nothing to do, like, you're questioning the idea that the system is broken, not the idea is broken. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to continue with our rebuttal here. Um, so I'd like to address uh, first some of uh, clarifying what I said about internet-based business, because I don't think that my uh, competitors here really understood. So when you create a website, as in when Amazon created its page, the page that you go to, you are putting in a ton of effort in coding, in in writing your content, in providing descriptions for those products that they even sell, all of which are covered under IP protection. If we did not have this protection, then we would have people copying Amazon as in an entirely new site that is identical to Amazon. Why else wouldn't they do it? It's a, it's a successful business, and if that is legal, it's money to be made, right? Um, so. Also, the stats that were provided were from an economical and statistical study um, by the US Patent and Trade Office. And IP intensive industry was defined as industries that would lose profit without IP. Now, I'd like to address one of the problems with my uh, opponent's uh, argument here. They talked about a lot of um, patent infringement cases which went up exponentially in these past years, right? Well, this has gone up um, along with the demand for IP in general. Um, WIPO, the World uh, in Intellectual Property Organization, actually released a conference uh, recently um, where Larry Curry said that the demand for IP has gone up immensely. 
Now we have patent infringement cases going up, IP demand going up, and innovation going up. All of these things are completely correspondent to each other, meaning that, if anything, that argument would mean that we should, in, uh, um, we should add more intellectual property rights. We should uh, improve upon it and, and push it more for innovation and um, uh, to match the demand. <laughs> so I'll let Victor talk now. <laughs> So I'll try and keep this uh, short and sweet. So throughout this entire debate, uh, your arguments have been centered entirely on the problems that the US patent system has had with preventing economic progress. And we can, I will say that yes, there are probably problems that the US patent system has created and continues to create today. However, the problems that we experience in today's world are not indicative of saying that all of intellectual property rights as an institution should be completely discarded. Yes, there have been abuses of the system, but again, this is of the system as we have it created today. Changes can be made and probably should be made, but this is, again, no way to say that intellectual property rights themselves should be gotten rid of as well. Your argument really hasn't provided a single real reason against intellectual property rights themselves, only against the faultiness of the U.S. institution as we have it today. In addition, you had argued that uh, intellectual property rights for an individual is not necessary to protect the growth of human progress. And I would like to counter by saying that intellectual property rights are basic human rights. Each human has the right to life liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And intellectual property rights are just like any other kind of property. What's the difference between property that's created with muscle and property that's created with the mind? It seems to be exactly the same to me. Slaves didn't have the right to the products of their labor, and as a result, they didn't have the rights to their life and to liberty. And so by taking away intellectual property rights or getting rid of them, you are essentially taking away basic human rights on which all other human rights are predicated. Because the right to life and liberty cannot exist without the basic rights to your own property. So, in conclusion, not only has your argument missed the point of what we are debating today, but some of the points that you make are essentially questioning the necessity of basic human rights. Thank you. All right, now we have a question and answer period from our judges. Um, I request that the judges ask their questions here from the podium so that all of you can hear it and the camera picks it up as well. Um, after each question is asked, both teams will get one minute to deliberate and then be able to deliver a two-minute response. Since we ended with them, we will start with the team in opposition. <laughs> Guess I gotta have my justice again. Hello. Um, so, just a point of information. I, I actually know him, Jeff Bezos, and yeah, they do a lot of trademark work, big time. In matter of fact, I think they own the trademark to the shopping cart itself. <laughs> um, back in that, I, I met him first in 1995. Okay, here's a question, uh, and this is for group two. Would you explain how a company would get a return on investment when they've been involved with a 10 to 12 year development and testing cycle, such as pharmaceuticals. Uh, and also, would you explain the cost of a drug going down when in fact a lot of the resistance is probably simply the medical system doesn't want to pay for those tests and it won't be reimbursed by insurance? So two parts on the pharmaceutical sector.
All right, to, <coughs> to answer the question, uh, while not having intellectual property would have dramatic effects on the structure of how we get research done, and I encourage you to think of it in an alternative uh, mindset of uh, ways you can um, compensate research. Uh, well, an alternative model to how research should be done, you can uh, fund research, you can, through government, you can fund research to, through grants, you can fund research by a lot of means. It does not have to be through a private company. Uh, perhaps you can uh, give a grant to a private company, but ultimately the, the research does not need to be done by a company and could be encouraged uh, by government. Um, uh, and uh, an idea is that what if all drug uh, pharmaceutical uh, factories, everything like that, they're all generic. There is no um, uh, brand drug, but the actual research to create to innovate drugs comes from different sources and that's public. So the actual like uh, factory behind it, physically making the drugs can be private and the funding for research can be public. Uh, so I have, a, I have one question for each side. Um, we'll start with the pro side. Um, one of the important historical events in the history of intellectual property for you was the United States Industrial Revolution. Uh, to the extent that that was largely based off of stolen factory plans from England, to what extent do you think it can be attributed to intellectual property protection? Um, and for the con side, um, you mentioned that there is a tripling of patent trolling from 2007 to 2012. Uh, the question is, was there an institutional change in that period that led to this sort of behavioral change? And if not, to what extent can intellectual property be blamed? And to what extent do you think we need a different explanation? Hello, everyone, again. Uh, to James' question, I say touche. <laughs> but <laughs> the way it worked out with the British idea of the factories, they were these large, full-scale, heavy machines that were just un untenable and something for our fledgling economy, something that was not something that we could manage. What happened was when we went in there and we took the idea, we had to completely change it to actually modify it to our smaller, more rural societal standards. So yes, the idea was certainly copied. And I can promise you, other countries also stole that idea. And the idea, being able to generate new ideas comes from the ability to reference other people's ideas. <laughs> Certainly, I will not, you have me on that, sir. <laughs> but the modification of the idea is not something that we're talking about. That is what the thing that intellectual po uh, property protects. That modification to something that is more suitable to a new environment and allowing that to be fostered. That is what, how it was created. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, to answer your second question, um, as far as like an institutional change, uh, no. Um, what actually has happened is um, opportunity was recognized 
um, working on, and what's been going on is we're trying to work it out of the system. Uh, but we needed to really define the scope of what has been patented because there's just way too many um, abstract ideas. And that's what allows um, that's what allows trolling to happen in, on such a large scale. And I mean, honestly, the only three things that we're actually, the three rights we have are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not property. So I mean, those things kind of need to be defined and protected. And I think with those in mind, we can use those ideas to protect it. So thank you. Question is a lot of pressure on me. Uh oh, better be a good one. There you go. Okay. So I have a very simple question for both groups. I don't know which one will answer first. If you own property, do you have to hold on to it, or can't you rent it through a process of what's called royalties or licensing fees? I think the best example is very simple: McDonald's. McDonald's offers franchises worldwide. They don't build all their stores. They simply say, use our model, and you can make money, but it's all your investment. And um, I'd just like each team to think about why aren't royalties part and licensing part of this discussion? Why would a company simply hoard all of its intellectual property? Thank you. Hello, everyone, again. Um, it's like we met here before. Huh? Um, to the question that was asked, and in the very brief amount of time that we had to think about it, I mean, uh, yes, of, of course. I, I, we, the idea of intellectual property, you have, the, uh, you have the ability to buy a home, and you can sell that home. You can buy a home, and you can rent that home. If you come up with an idea, and you patent that idea, and someone else has the resources to actually make that idea flourish and actually help not only you by benefiting by making it much cheaper, that actually overcoming that wall, like uh, actually getting it out there is more, it is exactly your right to actually make sure that your property goes where you choose it to go. And that just goes back to the idea that you have that you have the rights to everything that you either thought up or purchased, and making sure that that is actually preserved is something that needs to happen. All right, um, first of all, um, licensing has been a part of intellectual property rights for a very long time. And it seems intuitive, right? You don't have to buy a whole patent. A business can make a much smaller expenditure and use it for the time that they need it, and then they don't have to hold on to this expensive piece of paper. Um, when Tesla was actually creating alternating current, um, he patented, he licensed his intellectual property to Westinghouse. So we have seen it time and time again. But I would argue that in the current system, it still creates exclusionary situations. Because a lot of times, patents licensing fees are very high, and small businesses still can't afford it. And there are also sometimes other political factors involved that informally prevent small businesses from being able to license intellectual property. So it is a very good idea and concept, and it has worked many times. But uh, other times it creates exclusionary situations and uh, perpetuates monopolies. the judges will have five minutes to select a winner. Um, while we present the t-shirts and certificates to our debate participants. <laughs> so just a quick note, um, we've been doing this for 10 years and I just want to applaud the club and also the faculty for sponsoring this for the past 10 years. It's always been a real pleasure to come up here and hear such wonderful arguments on both sides. So 
applaud everybody. I'd also like to say this was one of the best prepared groups we've seen in all these debates over the many years. It was good data, there was good analysis going back, and as a former member representing the University of the Debate Union back in the 70s, again, the 70s, not 76, sounds a little bit better, um, <laughs> really did well, really followed the format well, really were well prepared, and so I really do appreciate that as well. This is always the hardest part. But overall, our judgment was for the cons. Thank you very much. But everybody did a great job. Thank you. All right. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, any undergraduates in the room, stick around. We've got a dinner and an award ceremony right down the hall. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody can stick around. Great. OK. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank our debaters, of course, um, our judges, Bill Troy, Lisa DeForge, James Santucci, and James Keller, and of course the Department of Economics, the Undergraduate Economics Club, and all of the alumni who came out for today's Alumni Advisory Board meeting. So thank you all. This is the end of our debate. Have a great night.